I'm ready. Good morning, welcome back. If you just registered for the class, welcome to CCS 381. The program for today is simple. We're going to expand and complete the general introduction from Monday by looking at two sequences from extraordinary films, one from 1950 in a, no, in a lonely place, and the second one from 1971, which is the sequence I described in words on Monday, Le Mans 1971. After that, I'll give you a tour of the website. We'll look at the syllabus. I will answer questions about the class, and finally, I would like to hear a little bit from you, your story, your journey, who you are, etc. Okay? So I'm going to use the screen today. And every class, every lecture is being recorded. Today, I had an issue with my iPad. It didn't charge because the electric system in the kitchen went off. And so it didn't recharge. And that's why I'm using two other tablets simply because I didn't have time to set them up. So I, I'm hoping that one of them will have everything right, HD resolution and audio, etc. In fact, if you go to week one and you scroll down, or if you go to the table of contents, you now see a new section called the YouTube videos of the lectures. And in here, you find a YouTube video of the first lecture, which is publicly available. And in the syllabus, I believe you also find, or in the content information, you also find uh, the coordinates of my YouTube channel where you can find those videos. So if you happen to miss any class, don't forget to watch, uh, within a reasonable time, the video of the class you missed instead of sending me one of those lame emails, did I miss anything? No, we were just shooting the breeze, talking BS, you know, nothing. Okay, so let me go back up and introduce the first film. So this is a frame from a 1950 film directed by Nicholas Ray, who was a wonderful Hollywood director, although he never won an Academy Award, but he was very much admired, for example, on the other side of the ocean in France, by, by French scholars, and intellectuals following cinema. We're going to watch a sequence not because it has something to do with the topic of the class. This is not a road movie. This was defined when it came out as a thriller. Scholars call it a film noir. A film noir is a film where more than the story, what counts, what's relevant is the atmosphere, is the vibe of the film, and in fact, the conclusion in a film noir oftentimes is open-ending or unsatisfying because there is more to it that cannot be resolved, and that's certainly the case in here. The story is simple. Humphrey Bogart, who was one of the top stars in 1950, he would die in 1957, and he did win an Oscar as Best Actor not for this film, for, for another, trying to remember what, which one. I, I, I know the movie, but I don't remember the title. Uh, and Humphrey Bogart is a Hollywood screenwriter who was successful before the war. Remember, the film is set around the time the movie came out, 1950. After the war, his career has been failing and However, he's being pursued by producers to write screenplays, but it's difficult. He is difficult to handle. He will not just write for money. He wants to write a good script. So they tell him to read a book, a trash book. 
and to write a screenplay which is supposed to be based strictly on this book. And they give him a book in a restaurant slash nightclub and he doesn't want to read the book. He has to read it by the next morning. But there is a woman there who read the book. She's the coat check girl, right? Girl by the definition of the language in that time. She has read the book and she says so in the initial scene. So he says, come to my house and you'll tell me about the book. I don't want to read the book. I don't care about this book. You just tell me the story. She goes to his apartment, which is very Melrose Place, one of those garden apartments in Hollywood, in California, where actors who are not particularly successful and people working in cinema tend to live. She tells him the story of the book, is not very impressed. And he sends her away. He gives her money, telling her that there is a taxi cab usually at the corner, and she can go home. The next morning, 5 a.m., he's woken up by a policeman, a cop, whom he knows because they were in the war together. In fact, Humphrey Bogart, uh, whose character's names, uh, name is Dixon Steele, was his commanding officer. And Nikolai, the cop, tells him, you have to come to the station. He goes to the station, and they tell him that the girl, the coat check girl, who came to his apartment to tell the story in the book on which he has to produce, create a script, a script died, was killed. Her body was found. It was thrown out of a car, and she was strangled. And of course, he's one of the suspects, right? Because she spent part of the night with him, and the police wants to know whether she was alive when she left the apartment. Another eyewitness comes in, in the sequence that we will see. It's Laurel. She lives in the same complex in these garden apartments. She just moved in. Humphrey Bogart and uh, uh, so Dixon and Laurel have been seeing each other from opposite sides of the building. So they've had their eyes on each other. She tells the captain that yes, she saw the girl leave Dixon's apartment at a certain time of the night. She was alive. So in a way, she provides an alibi for him. After that, the rest of the movie can be divided into sections. One is a love story. Laurel and Dixon fall in love, and as a consequence for this love, he starts writing. And he starts writing a very good script. Of course, he takes liberties on the book, the story in the book. He's writing pretty much what he wants, but he's being creative. Remember what we said about cinema? and psychology, cinema and psychiatry, here you find the element of healing that is often found, or some kind of psychological therapy or lesson for the viewers, you find it in this movie as well. Healing in this case is a broken man, probably also suffering from PS PSTD because of the war, who has found his creativity because of a woman who loves him. And of course, this is a very traditional role in terms of female roles. However, this is only the first half, and it has to be very romantic. It has to be pure love, right? Not a cloud. But the second half is the killer, the murderer, is not being found. The police is interrogating Dixon and Laurel time after time. And Laurel starts to think that maybe Dixon is guilty. Maybe Dixon did it. Because there are some worrisome clues. For example, the girl, while in the apartment, telling the story, retelling the story in the book, at some time she is acting up the story in the book. And she says, help, help, help. So Laurel knows, probably heard, 
these screams of help. But she doesn't tell the police. Yet, this is building up suspicion in herself. Then she starts seeing a darker side to him. He can be problematic. He can be violent. He can be can have anger management issues. Although probably we're talking about post-traumatic stress disorder, which didn't exist as a diagnosis during the time, but the script constantly alludes to the war, to the experience of the war, before the war, after the war. So by the end of the film, he proposes to her. And he's not the kind of guy who easily commits to a relationship. So big step for him. He's ready to commit, go all the way with her. She says yes, but she prepares to run away. Because she cannot marry the man whom she suspects might be a murderer. There is a dramatic scene on one side of this sequence the sequences are uh, inter interlaced. On one side, the police has arrested the real killer, who was the boyfriend of the coat check girl. And they're trying to reach out to Laurel and Dixon to apologize and to explain that they're fine, they're clear. And so these clouds would be removed from the horizon of their love. Yet, they are incommunicado, and they're arguing, and the argument escalates into violence. And he grabs her and chokes her. And then, of course, he lets her go. Right? He realizes the magnitude of his gesture, lets her go, move to another room. Finally, they answer the phone. He answers the phone. The policeman, Nikolai, tells him the captain wants to apologize. You're fine. You, you can live a serene and happy life. He says, there is a man, says to, to her, there is a man who wants to apologize to you. She listens to the captain. She knows that her suspicions were wrong. But she says, this doesn't mean anything. For us. If this phone call had come yesterday, before he proposed, then it would have meant the world for us. But at this point, of course, she cannot marry him in spite of that. And talking about the lack of a resolution, the movie ends and they separate. And the movie, in a way, is about the impossibility of true love if you're a broken man. But there are a lot of questions left, right? Who is really Dixon? Could he be killing someone? Is he really such a violent individual? Okay. The reason why we're watching this sequence is the sequence in which Dixon enters the police station the night after the, the night of the murder to be interrogated, and ends with him leaving the police station, the building of the police station. Of course, most of this movie is shot inside a, a studio, right? That, that was the style. We're watching this sequence because we were talking about what is cinema compared to other genres. So, in a few words, if you tell it with words, it's literature. If you tell it with words and actions, it's theater. If you tell it with images, it's cinema. Yet even inside cinema, we said the key to the cinematic nature of a product is how you use your body. And the reason why, even though you may shoot a lot of short videos, none of you is an Instagram millionaire, is that if you look at the short videos that are successful on YouTube, Instagram, <coughs> TikTok, now look at the way they use their body. Look at the pace and the rhythm of even the smallest gestures. Look at the pace of the voice, etc. So reality by itself 
even if you have a funny kid, you don't have a video necessarily with 20 million hits. Because the video, the, 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 in real life, the, you, your kid is funny. The video might be cute, but the video itself doesn't have the production qualities to be successful, okay? Same with films. You cannot just shoot people doing something and call it a film because once you place reality on the screen, it doesn't feel like the representation of reality. In order to feel that, you have to formulate it differently. And so this is a wonderful example. If you think of a spectrum where on one end you have the most theatrical use of the body because that is imported from theater. On the other end of the spectrum you have how people use their body at SAC in the cafeteria during lunch. All films are somewhere within the spectrum, but never a 100% match with what you can see in a cafeteria, in real life. This is the most theatrical, and this is perfect Hollywood, 100% Hollywood. By 1950, they've perfected the art of cinema. So what you're supposed to notice is how stiff the body postures are, how each character assumes a position after moving, and they keep that position. They don't move an inch from that unless the character is supposed to move. And when they're talking, shoulders are perfectly even, very little movement in the rest of the body, close to nothing for some of these actors. And that's the difficulty of acting, selective use of your body, not memorizing the lines, not infusing the lines with drama and emotion. No, that's not. People don't look like actors because if you're an amateur actor, you move too much. Most people move too much with their feet, with their body, and that's distracting. What is the outcome of this particular kind of theatrical stiffness? What is the goal? The goal, of course, is to focus your attention on the drama of the lines, right? And the story told by the lines. And also, what is the other secondary effect of this kind of approach to acting and filmmaking? That the background, the scene comes alive. Because you're not distracted by the bodies. You're not, your eyes are not following the shifting bodies, the shifting movie, movie, body movements of, of the body. And the background, after a while, because, of course, it's a series of camera shots that are fixed, the background comes into your mind. And in this case, for example, the background means stiff body captain, police captain, body posture, Laurel, who's supposed to provide an alibi for the man who will become her lover, but in the background, you find pictures of crime scenes. And to the side, and this can be better viewed in other, from other camera angles, you have a table with statistics about crime. Okay? So, and not only here, but almost in every other scene, the design of the set is very intentional, right? They've picked every single item. And this is true of movies of today, but in this case, it is all very bare, very essential, because this is typical of a film noir, which is the essence of a tragedy. A tragedy that is so difficult to accept because it's not even a tragedy. Because a tragedy you can reconcile with, but this is a tragedy without any possibility of acceptance or reconciliation because it's open-ended. Because by the end of the movie, you understand why they're not together, but you don't understand. You understand that he didn't kill this woman, but you don't know whether he's a killer or not. Okay, so this is the essence of film noir, open, unresolved, and such is life.
Okay, so let's look at this on Amazon and in here you find all the, I put links if you want to watch this movie in its entirety, you find on Tubi with ads for free. Uh, it's being screened uh, in Queens at the Museum of the, of the Motion Image on Saturday, this Saturday at 3.30, if you live in Queens. And uh, you find it on Amazon, etc. Uh, but I, I always, for every movie, I'll put a link to justwatch.com, which I don't know if you're familiar with the app and the website, provides all the options and they're updated routinely, regularly, all the options, all the platforms where you can watch a movie. You don't have to watch it for the class. Watch it because it's a great little movie uh, and, and great acting by both the, the protagonist, Dixon, and, and Laurel. So we don't have a lot of time for comments, but did you see it? Did you see the fixity? Did you see the intentional use of the body, meaning that whenever you move a muscle or twitch an eye or raise your eyebrow, it has to mean something for the character? That's a perfect example of that. Of course, you never find, you rarely find, not never, but you rarely find this extreme kind of rigidity in postures and placements in today's movies, but as I said, if you want to put reality on a screen, you cannot just take a camera and shoot people. That's a documentary, that's not a film, and you cannot build a film on a realistic reproduction of real life. It has to be filtered through a series of techniques. Quick comments about the sequence, the acting, Okay, tough audience. And the next one, we don't have much time. So again, if you want to know more, you find a few links and as usual, you find it, this, this next movie on Amazon Prime and there are more platforms where you can find it. If you go to justwatch.com, you'll find it. Le Mans, the initial sequence of Le Mans, I described with words because my description was meaningful and preceded the sequence in such a way that you can now appreciate its cinematic qualities. It's six or seven minutes with maybe two lines in all. So it's a perfect example of the essence of cinema telling a story with images and building a story through the gaps and the questions. That is to say, you see people and you're interested in them because of the way they act, because of the pace of the editing. But then you're building the story in your mind. You're not listening to the story. As I said before, most modern movies, especially commercial movies, talk too much, say too much. Same is true for literature, right? Too much. I was thinking the perfect example of too much uh, would, would be, what's the, the, the name of the trilogy with s &M situations? I'm sorry? Fifty Shades. Fifty Shades, exactly. Oh my God. A thousand pages, really? Too much. You have at best 300 pages of, of material there. Too much, way too much. Becomes boring. In here, you build a story through the gaps and the questions. You see, you know what you're seeing, but then you wonder, what is the story of this character? How are they connected? What happened in their past, etc. Okay, so let's watch this. This is the very beginning of the film.
the story of a race car driver going to Le Mans near Paris for a famous endurance race, one of the most famous races in 1971, with hundreds of thousands of people coming to see the race. And notice that the same way the first part of this sequence builds the story through subtraction of elements, subtraction of content. You're not pro given lines to understand what is going on. In the same way, the second half of the sequence, the accident, the flashback with the accident from the year before, is built around the subtraction of light, the subtraction of information from the camera, because it's all through darkness and sounds, darkness and lights, partial elements, fragments of the story. So it's all a pattern of subtraction. And because information is being subtracted from the film, your mind is getting into the story, right? This has a trance-like and a hypnotic effect. You immerse yourself into the story through the process of understanding, right? Whereas if you're being told everything, you have to intentionally decide, okay, I'll get into this. This is my thing or it's not my thing. Okay. So this would be a good example of telling a story with images, with editing, with light in such a way that some information is provided and more information develops in forms of hypotheses, scenarios, questions in the mind of the spectators. To contrast with Fifty Shades, I can mention another successful book, which is at least written better, which is The Da Vinci Code, where you just have a paragraph at the beginning of the first page to describe Paris and the Louvre. Half a page, you don't need 10 pages because it's Paris, okay? And that's how art, in a way, works. Comments on this one? Give me a little bit of satisfaction. Any comment? Yes. Um, I, I just loved the, the 60s, like, where you could tell during the, the racing sequence when they turned off most of the lights, you could tell that, like, there were people on a set holding those lights and like running towards the camera. And I, I kind of love that, that little behind the scenes moment that you can like. It, it depends what, it, it, where, where do you see lights being moved by people? What do you mean? Because but there are actual race cars. This yes, is yeah, but like there's a about moment. the only movie in which racing is not fake. There, there's like a moment where like you have two sets of headlights and they like almost merge together. Mm -hmm. So you know that there's no like, it, the one that's supposed to be in front, you know there's no substance to that vehicle because you see the other car's lights. It could be, I've, 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 I've never, I, I would have to see again. Mm -hmm. uh, I, my reaction was based on the fact and there are bo entire books based on this and more recently in 2015, a documentary about the movie Le Mans. They spent about three, three and a half months in there from the day of the race in June 1970 to sep end of September, beginning of October. And they did everything for real. With real race cars, they rented from, from privateers. Uh, and in the case of Porsche, probably Porsche gave them some cars. Ferrari refused. And it's one of the few race, racing movies where cars are actually going at least 150 miles, not 55 miles while the other cars are doing 25, which is pitiful. Mm -hmm. or, or slowing down a 50 mile per hour car as in rush to pretend they're going 200 miles uh, per hour. Mm -hmm. So realistic that one of the gentleman drivers who was engaged for the shoots had an accident, lost his leg. David Piper, I think, was his name. And they spent so much time on the racetrack that Steve McQueen, who was producing the film, ran out of money, and they, he had to 
uh, give out uh, all the rights he had on the movie, uh, give up on his own salary as an actor, $750,000 of the time, so that other producers would put in the money to finish the movie, and they brought in another director to finish the movie. Okay, so um, I realize that I only have 10 minutes, so I'll move quickly through the rest of my plan. Um, here it is. So keep in mind, this would be the actual address of the website of the class on the servers of Notion, which is a wonderful app, but you don't need the app. You just need a browser to uh, come here to this place. And the best way to remember how to get to the website of the class is either by using this tiny URL or by typing andreaferi.com slash ccs381 and you'll be redirected. The first few times you go from here uh, to the website, you'll be asked to confirm that you want to go there and then automatically the browser will recognize that you're doing this routinely and this intermediate passage will be eliminated, will be removed um, and once you click on this and confirm, you get to the portal of the class, right, where you find very few sections. One is about the road, because the road in itself is symbolic, especially in American culture. And then you find some content, info, and a picture. Feel free to judge me. I only take about two pictures per year of myself, so the choice was very limited. And this is pretty much what I am, right? I, I know I'm not normal. Very few professors are normal anyway. So, right? Everyone is special in their own way. Other sections, of course, you have the lectures and reading section. This is the most important part. You go to any week and you find an outline of the week, but you go to the page of the week, and there you find class notes, links, you find the YouTube videos of the class, the day after each class a YouTube video is posted, and you find the assignments together with notes about the assignments. For example, the first assignment will be what I call the viewing notes, and I'll talk more about this next week, but you have an extensive description of what the viewing notes are and what do they entail, right? So you have prompts that you can review, but we'll review them together next week. And of course you have readings the first week. The readings are trivial, right? Read the syllabus, review the notes, and I added, a few more sections of, brief sections of this website and two articles from British newspaper The Guardian as recommended readings, okay? So, the next section is the news and announcement where I usually post some interesting cultural announcements. In this case, I used it to uh, highlight five movies that you may have seen that came out during the last 12 months with some indication of what they're about just to make you think about the topic of the class but in here I might also post if I did some relevant changes if I modified one of the pages etc and I can get out of here and go to the calendar section where week after week you have the time of the lecture, the time of my in-person office hours, the floor of the library, and also when you find me available on Zoom, which is Monday, Wednesday, Thursday from 3 to 6. But I suggest that I recommend that you use my Calendly page, currently is another app, to choose a time and, and reserve a time. You can cancel, etc. So 
you go here and you want to see me today, you click on the 25th and you see that today, right now, I only have the 4.30 spot available between three and six. This happens because it's the first week of the semester. I'm the advisor to the students in the program of globalization studies. I have about 100 majors and minors who are looking for me, uh, trying to switch classes, add to a specific class, apply a class to the major, etc. Okay, and that was the calendar. And of course, finally, we have the syllabus. Let me go quickly to the films, right? So this is the list of the films we will be watching in class, but actually you will be watching those films, right? This is not the 2010s anymore. We used to have labs in a room where the students would gather on Wednesday, 7 to 9 p.m. In this case, it would have been and you would watch the movie together. Now that component has become online asynchronous, which means that every week, with the exception of the first one, you have to go online at your own, during your own time and watch the movie of the week. And for every movie, I will provide information on where to find it streaming online, and there are always a variety of options. And uh, of course, most movies require a, a fee, right? You need to be rented or purchased, but practically every movie, I think, it's $4.99 or less than $4.99 to rent. And if you want to buy it, usually it's between $3.99 and $14.99, okay? And keep in mind that depending on the platform, after you rent the film, you have 48 hours to watch it, which means you can watch it once, but you can also watch it again while you're doing the assignment, and especially if you watch it twice, then it becomes easier also to talk about it, to do the assignments, to have a discussion, to uh, talk about the film in the, uh, during the final exam. The final paper will be on one of these four films. So not one of the films that I'm showing and presenting in this class but other road, road movies, other good representatives of the road movie genre, uh, the most recent, well, the most recent would be Hit the Road, but you have the Oscar winning film, best film, uh, Nomadland, so that in the paper, instead of regurgitating what you can read on movie reviews, you have to apply the idea of the class to a film that is in many ways or in some ways similar to the films that we will be analyzing. So you, you learn how to and you proceed with that without doing something completely boring for you and for me as well. Let's skip the bibliography and let's go to The great components, 10% attendance and participation. As you see, I take attendance every class. If you miss more than five class for any reason, even a justifiable reason, you have to make up for participation by providing a report of the class after you watch the video of the class, okay? And you do that, these reports as well as the assignments, inside a Google Docs file that I will share with each student <coughs> Haven't done it yet because people are still adding, dropping, but by Monday, each one of you will have their Google Docs file accessible to me and to you as editors where you post the assignments and where you, I leave comments, grades, etc. And that includes the final paper, for example, so everything goes there, one place for everything. 20% is the viewing notes, viewing notes for eight films. Again, you find prompts about the viewing notes under week one, and I'll discuss them uh, next week, and you see the series of films requiring viewing notes. And 15% for three short essays. Viewing notes can be loose notes, don't have to be a narrative. Essays need to have an introduction, a conclusion, and a middle part 
right? But they're not very long, and about three of the films, Il Sorpasso, Tom and Louise, and Mad Max Fury Road. 30% for a paper on one of those four films that I said before, that I showed you before, and 25% for a final exam, which is basically you come here to this room awfully early in the morning. Our exam slot is 8 a.m., okay? So you come here with bleary eyes, and I show you at 30 minutes interval three scenes from films that will be discussed in class, and you comment on that sequence, and you comment on the film itself. Before the end of the semester, I'll provide a short list. The short list will only include four or five films. So you prepare, you review those films, you come here, I show you the scenes, you write about them, showing your understanding of those films, okay? Very simple. This was the syllabus and everything else, of course, is in there and it's now 11.25 and, and I have to uh, uh, postpone another time getting to know you a little bit. If you have any questions, feel free to ask right now or come to my office right after the class, library and 3000. Okay, thank you for uh, coming again and I'll see you on Monday.